Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the risen and living Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for my meditation this morning is the epistle reading, especially the first paragraph read a moment ago. John, as you know, was the last apostle to depart this world. Youngest disciple, last to leave. And as such, he must have felt a a very heavy burden of responsibility, as it were, to shut the door to the apostolic age. He could see how the apostolic word was faring in the world at the end of the century. And in some ways, very good, because it had covered the civilized world, as God commanded. But in some ways, there were very many cautions. And in his last writings, including this one, St. John expresses concerns about things that are near at hand and, in the book of Revelation, things that are still far distant. In the book of Revelation, (coughs) in the Isle of Patmos, the vision he saw addresses seven churches, six of whom are on the brink of apostasy and to whom he calls to repentance. In that vision also he sees a great deceiver arise, the same one that he here calls the Antichrist, who will deceive many with his religious glory. And then at the end of time, just before the second return and the end of all things, he sees the abyss is opened by God and the demon, the devil, is allowed to go over the world again and spread his lies and to blind the nations of the earth. Now today we see the validity of these concerns, not just in the history that transpired after John, But in our present day, we see them taking place. And on this word, and the relevance of this word to our day, let me talk to you about the greatest dangers Christians face. What it is, and how we escape it. Now before addressing the danger itself, let me remind you of what the most lethal weapon is in the devil's arsenal. It is, it is not as many people would think it to be. One of the supernatural powers that belong to the angelic class of creatures. No, it's not that, although Satan possessed these powers. But it is more simply the lie. The lie is the most lethal and deadly weapon. He is primarily, in Scripture, the great deceiver. That's his favorite, and that's his most effective weapon. In fact, John really emphasizes that. In his Gospel, Jesus' conversation with the Pharisees, he says, you are of your father, the devil, and he calls the devil the father of lies, the one who invented the lie. In fact, in one translation, it says, lying is his native tongue. That's my favorite. Lying is the devil's native tongue. That's his language. And he's good at it. How excellent he is at it is seen in the fact that he deceived a perfect man and a perfect woman who lived in a perfect garden, a perfect creation. And he was capable of deceiving them. The first lie he told, take note, was that God's lying to you. First lie he said was that somebody else is lying to you and here you look to me for the truth and I will tell you the truth. He doesn't want you to be as God, but I do. That's how liars operate. That's how Satan operates. If you want to get somebody distracted, tell them that they're a liar or these people are liars, but I am the one who is the truth. And then he deceived them and the world today we see the condition of the world today is a direct result of that lie. The chaos, the violence, the misery, the poverty, the death, that is a direct result of that first lie. And the devil keeps this world in its 
his prison. He keeps the world in darkness so that it cannot escape, and he always does it through the lie. Note that Jesus did not defeat the devil through his omnipotence. We see that in the end of the text, but through, through propitiation. He did not defeat the devil through his omnipotence, but rather came into the world to bear witness to the truth. When Pilate asked him if he were a king, he, he and said yes, truthfully, but not uh, challenging your kingdom. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. He's the king of truth. His truth is the light that shines in Satan's darkness. His truth is that which scatters the darkness of Satan and sets people free. Again, John chapter 8. You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free free. Now having reminded you of that, let me note, and I think you will agree, how casual, what a casual attitude there is today in our culture about lying. And I, maybe it's always been so, but it is remarkable against this background how, what a casual attitude we have about lying and its seriousness. Well, first of all, it's not addressed in the church's seven cardinal sins. It's not one of the cardinal sins listed there. And probably if we were given a list of sins, we wouldn't place it in the top tier. We wouldn't place it next to the fifth commandment, murder, for Pete's sake. We wouldn't place it next to the sixth commandment, adultery and, and being deceptive with your husband or wife. We would probably not even place, uh, set it on an equality with stealing, since we treasure those things, we don't want people to take them from us. In fact, lying is a relatively small sin today. It's something that we all partake of and kind of laugh about. And there are many today who deny such a thing as truth, as absolute truth. There is no absolute truth, which of course is saying that lying is merely a figment of your imagination. Because if there is no truth, then there can be no lie, which is the opposite of truth. And the ability to lie is now uh, almost, it, it seems, a necessity in many of the normal vocations of our lives. It's a necessity in perhaps marketing and presenting your product to the world. It's almost a necessity in, or certainly a necessity in politics, getting voted into office. It is a necessity almost in law, and probably a necessity in every vocation, and it has found a solid place in religion. Not only in the religions that lead you uh, into another god, but into the Christian religion, in the visible church, it has found a comfortable place and fair as well. And John knew that this was coming. He saw it in his own day, and he addresses the danger. Now, here's the chief danger. Here's the danger. Gullibility. Gullibility doesn't seem so bad, does it? It almost seems innocent. Children are gullible. Gullibility is like childlike faith. You believe anything. Isn't that sweet? And isn't faith what God wants? Isn't that exactly what he's calling for? Faith. And Thomas, I don't want it on the basis of touching me. I want you to believe based on my word, the truth. But, you know, faith isn't intrinsically a virtue. I mean, it isn't a virtue in and of itself. Because there's such a thing as false faith. And to put your faith or your trust in a false object is not a virtue, it's a sin. It's called idolatry. And it's listed in the very first commandment of God. That's putting your faith in a false object and trusting it above all. Gullibility is really the greatest danger, and it's what Adam and Eve fell to. The devil leads many into 
to hell actually thinking and sincerely thinking they're heading to God and to heaven. So John says, Beloved, that is God loves you, do not believe every spirit. Why? For many false prophets have gone out into the world. This means simply, do not be gullible. The false prophets he talks about are the voices by which Satan deceives and leads you in a different direction than God would lead you. And as Satan is very good at the lie, he makes his prophets very, very good at lying. They seem to be harbingers of truth. And so we need to prepare ourselves, and especially our children, from the danger they face in this world as Christians. Now that's not unusual. In a culture, every parent in a home has to learn how to be aware of danger in their particular place and circumstance and to train their children up to beware of danger. I knew a, a missionary kid uh, who lived his young years in, in Africa. And he was trained, contrary to most of us, was trained to watch out for the wild animals, <laughs> especially the vipers, the snakes that were there. He went out one, one day and saw a snake on his back porch. It was a very venomous snake. Well, you would obviously want to teach your children what to stay away from there. But even when we've conquered uh, the wild, even in our civilized world, or what we call a civilized world, there are dangers. In South Chicago, I can't imagine what parents must do to take care of their children and warn them about gangs and warn them about avoiding the danger of gunshots and so forth. You'd be foolish not to train up your children and to warn them how to be safe in such a dangerous place. And of course, all of us now know, because of child predators, the concept of stranger danger. Don't just get into anybody's car who offers you candy and so forth. Of course we want to teach our children about the dangers that they face. And here it is with Christians. The greatest danger you face and the greatest danger your child faces is the lie of the evil one, his deception. And so how do you escape it? Well, here John says, test the spirits to see whether they are from God. In other words, discernment. Be able to judge, to sift, to know what is true and what is not true. In heaven, there is no evil. We're not going to have to watch out for things. But here on earth, there's evil everywhere, and oftentimes parading as if it were good. And a statement or a teaching can be tested, John says. But how is that so? Well, I'll tell you how it's not so. It's not tested by worldly wisdom and reason. Because St. Paul says, you will never reach God by your wisdom and your reason and your philosophy. You will never figure him out. You never get to that point. We are ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's how it was. That's how it is. That's how it always will be. And not your emotions, not your instincts, not your inner feelings. The Bible says there is a way which seems right to a man, and the end thereof are the ways of death. Certainly not, we should need to tell our children this, not majority opinion. Whoever has the most voices of affirmation is not necessarily the correct answer. For oftentimes, and Jesus says it will be, that the many will be going into the broad gate into hell and the few going through the narrow gate to heaven. Nor is it waiting for God to give you some direct revelation from heaven. Because what you interpret as a direct revelation from God may be from Satan himself. Because your heart is deceitful, Jeremiah says, above all things, who can know it? Now John points you to this. He points you to the apostolic witness. That is, to the writings of the apostles. He says, little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. 
They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God, and whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. They are the false prophets that the devil sends out into the world. They have departed from the apostles. They have often said the apostles are wrong. St. Paul had to deal with these people. The apostles are wrong. We are right. They are followed by many people. Don't be deceived. Because they are followed by many people because they speak from the world. They speak the world's wisdom. They speak the world's language. They speak what the world wants to hear. The world has itching ears. Therefore, they can gather great numbers. We have these false prophets, as it were, in almost every vocation. We have seen recently politicians can do this. I tell you, take any sin, however serious of a sin, however much of a perversion the, the Bible calls it, slap it with some kind of language of love, put, wrap it up with Jesus, and then put a scripture passage to it, and many would-be Christians are following like little ducklings across the street and enduring the danger of that person's leadership. Why? Because many Christians really don't know the scriptures. Here's what they know. They know buzzwords. Well, if he's for love, and is he for Jesus, and so forth, then he must be speaking the Bible. But this is especially true with religious leaders, even those who call themselves Christians. Jesus tells us specifically to beware of those who are wolves in sheep's clothing, meaning they're pretending to be Christians. Satan sends many of these, his servants, into the harvest fields, precisely because they can do the most damage there. They're in our churches. They're in our pulpits. They're in our schools. He sends them everywhere that he can create deception, and they are in uh, the dress of sheep's clothing. They're dressed as an angel of light. That's the devil's camo, as it were. That's how he deceives so many. When the devil is unleashed, as St. John says that he will be, multitudes of these false prophets will fill the earth and draw many after them. Ultimately, then, God gives the culture over to the lie. In other words, before, they are believing a lie against better knowledge. But after they do that for a period of time, they actually do believe the lie. They think it is true, however absurd it may be. They actually do believe it. Now, the true prophets, us, St. John says, are sent by God. They... Uh, who, who go forth in the, in the uh, tradition and, and practice of the apostles are speaking in accordance with the witness of the apostles. That is their mark. Whoever knows God listens to us, the apostles. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us, the apostles. In other words, now for us, it's the testimony of Scripture which the apostles have put their imprimatur on. This is the word you may trust with absolute certainty. St. Paul says the, the uh, word of the prophets and apostles is the very foundation of the church. Take that away, and you have no longer a foundation. So the scripture is the standard by which we measure everything. It's the ruler by which we measure everything. Now, if Satan can mimic the, the miracles of God, as he did before Pharaoh, when Moses did miracles, Certainly, he can mimic true preachers. He can send forth eloquent preachers. But here's the thing. They do not preach in their eloquence and lead a person to Christ and him crucified, to what John says Christ did, that he paid for our sins. 
that he delivered us from God's wrath. He is the propitiation for our sins. Now what they do is take the Bible, they take their own ideas and they make the Bible conform to these ideas that they have made up. And thus John writes, By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Now, false prophets may speak Jesus' name, but they'll point you to a Jesus that is very different from the creed you just confessed, from the second article of the creed. That is not the Jesus. They point you to your emotions, or they point you to your desire for wealth, or they uh, point you to living a good life. But the true prophet will always point you to that central event in history, the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. There are three events in history. Their creation and fall, which created uh, and messed up this whole world, the fall. There is the coming of God in visitation in Jesus who raised the earth in redemption and brought us back into fellowship with God, and then there is his coming at the last day. In this, the preacher is preaching, the true preacher is preaching. This is the incarnation. This is the mission of Christ, to save you from your sins. That is to take your place, to become the sinner for you, to endure the wrath of God in your place, to taste and drink your cup. And so, to set you free, your freedom is not to live as you please in your flesh. Your freedom is to believe that your sin is forgiven, that you are now a child of God, that you are beloved of God, and that sets you free to walk in the path of righteousness. Now, in his second epistle, St. Paul, or St. John, echoes these same words. You see how clearly it is in his thought. He says, many deceivers have gone out into the world. Those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. And such a one is a deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourself so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in this teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him in your house or give him any greeting, for whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. We're to have nothing, nothing to do with those who are teaching other than the word of Christ. Dear friends, in conclusion, let me remind you, I don't have to remind you, that there is a virus today that terrifies the world. I went into Starbucks this morning, and as I usually do and in going into Starbucks or most other stores, there's a huge sign that has a face mask and reminds me that there is a virus in the world. You see the marks on the floor, and it reminds you six feet distance, there is a virus in the world. You hear it on television. In every way, you cannot get away from the virus that is in the world and terrifying the world. And I'm not going on either side of whether those things are bad or good. I'm not going to put my mark anywhere. I'm going to say to you this, whether they're bad or good. That terror is small potatoes compared to the real danger you face and your children face. It is nothing. It is infinitely small compared to what God wants you to consider the danger in your life and the life of your children. And I wonder sometimes why Christians are so absolutely diligent. I mean, I know why they're diligent to protect from temporal danger. They're so diligent to protect from temporal danger, and I don't criticize them for that. But these same Christians I do not see are especially diligent in protecting their children from the real danger. That is the eternal danger. For the real danger we face is not that which affects the body, 
Jesus said, if they kill the body, so what? Fear him who can take both soul and body to hell. It doesn't matter if you have another year or two years or five years or a decade. If you lose your soul, you have lost everything. Your soul and the soul of your children is everything. And the first protection you need is the protection of your soul, which Satan is ever, night and day, trying to take from you and from your children. The first protection you need is to know the Scriptures and to know them well. To put the prayer in practice that you hear from the, pul- from the altar oftentimes in our church. To read, to mark, to learn, and to inwardly digest your holy word. And then to teach it diligently to your children, which is God's command all the way through Scripture. That means morning and noon and night, every day, every teaching moment of your life, because you need them to know what is most important. How blessed is it, it is in a home when children like Timothy, St. Paul's assistant, were raised on the lap of their mama and their grandma. And St. Paul says, from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise to salvation, to know them as they know their backyard, as they know their house. They can now if they become so well acquainted, they can now leave the nest and be affected by all kinds of things that come in, but they can truly test the Spirit. And they can decide what is right and what is wrong on the basis of the proper standard. And that is what we want. That is what God wants, desperately not only to bring your children in baptism to the truth, but to keep them in that truth so that you can abide for all eternity with them. God grant to us and to our children the spiritual wisdom to discern in our day between the truth and the lies. Amen. And now may the peace of God which passes understanding guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ to life everlasting.